Today we're going to talk about 31 different tax tips that'll help you optimize your tax situation and reduce the anxiety that you might feel about taxes. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Tu and I'm a CPA who specializes in helping resellers and online businesses with taxes and accounting and we're just going to dive into tip number one. So the first tip I would give you is to get a separate bank account. If I had to choose only one thing I could tell you, it would be to get a separate account. And you're gonna to wanna to link your platform payouts to that account, any business related credit cards, and you just want all of your business related transactions to flow through that one account. This is gonna do more for you from an accounting and tax standpoint than most other things that you could be doing. And even if you're not doing regular bookkeeping, it's gonna make your life a lot easier for when you do decide, if you decide to go back and do that bookkeeping, or when it's time to do your taxes, you can go back and have all that information right there in the same place. And if you're a sole proprietor, you don't necessarily have to get a separate business account, you can use a separate personal account as long as you're using it for business transactions only. If you use the same account both for business and personal transactions, the longer you do that, the messier things are going to be. And you're putting yourself at risk to either overstating your income, in which case you're going to pay more tax, or understating your income and overstating your deductions and be a target for the IRS. So make sure the first thing you do is just get a separate bank account to run all your business transactions through. The next tip is to find a bookkeeping system that works for you. Now you might think this means like a full blown bookkeeping system like QuickBooks Online, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be as simple as a pen and paper. You could use a spreadsheet. You could use a simple program like QuickBooks Self-Employed, which is similar to the now obsolete GoDaddy bookkeeping, which was a simpler program. Or you could get a more robust official bookkeeping program like QuickBooks Online or Xero or FreshBooks. Those are what are referred to as double entry accounting systems where you can book journal entries, debits and credits and all that stuff. But you don't necessarily have to do that. You just have to find a way to be able to track your income and expenses so that you can know what's going on in your business and that's so you're ready for tax time. The next step is to determine your optimal business structure. And when I say business structure, I'm referring to, are you a sole proprietorship? Are you an LLC? Are you an S corp? Hopefully you're not a C corp. And we're gonna talk about all those, but in summary, a sole proprietorship is what you are by default. There's nothing you have to do to become a sole proprietor. If you start selling for a profit, then that's what the IRS considers you to be. Most businesses are sole proprietorships. If you do change, the next typical step would be to form an LLC, and there are various reasons to do that. And then many businesses stay there, but those who do change convert for tax purposes to what's known as an S corporation. Now, those are typically not entities that you need to form on day one. For most resellers, there's no urgency to be anything other than a sole proprietorship in the beginning. Next tip is to learn about the sole proprietorship. So remember, the sole proprietorship is what you are by default. When you sell your first item on eBay with an intent to make a profit, the IRS can considers you to be a sole proprietorship. Now with a sole proprietorship, there's no legal separation between you as an individual and your business. It's the simplest and least expensive way to start a business. It does have the most liability exposure, but if you're selling jeans or shirts, that's typically not a very high risk activity, or if you don't have significant personal assets. And I don't want to discourage you from taking the next step for liability protection, which is typically the LLC, but you just don't need to feel tons of pressure to do it from day one. Taxes for your sole proprietorship are done as part of your personal tax return on what's called a Schedule C. It's just a separate page of the individual tax return where you list your income and deductible expenses. Next step is to learn about the LLC. LLC stands for Limited Liability Company and not Limited Liability Corporation. And in my opinion, there are four main reasons to form an LLC. One reason might be that you just want to appear to be a more legitimate type of business entity. Another reason might be that it's a requirement in your case to be able to work with certain banks or wholesalers or vendors. One of the main reasons that people form an LLC is to take advantage of the limited liability. This means that if anybody ever sues your business, they can't also come after your personal assets. They have to stop at the business. So it's a way to protect your personal assets. But my favorite reason to form an LLC is that it can act as a stepping stone to be able to form an S corporation, which can in some cases yield significant tax savings. Doing your taxes as an LLC typically won't be any different than doing them as a sole proprietorship. There are no tax savings with forming an LLC, but you can't become an S corp straight from a sole proprietorship. And forming an LLC, in my opinion, is the best way to be able to take that next step, if it makes sense, of becoming an S corp. 
Next tip is to learn about the S-Corp and whether or not it makes sense for you. So an S-Corporation is not technically an entity. It's more of a tax election. It typically cannot exist independently. It has to be layered on to a different type of entity like a C-Corporation or an LLC. So when you form an LLC and then become an S-Corp, technically what you're doing is you're having your LLC make an election with the IRS to be taxed according to subchapter S of the Internal Revenue Code. So what does that mean? The biggest difference is that you're going to be taxed differently. So your S Corp is not subject to self-employment tax, which is another tip we'll talk about, but basically self-employment tax is a 15% tax on your profits. And that's a tax you have to pay as a sole proprietor, as an LLC, but not as an S Corp. You do have to pay the equivalent of some self-employment taxes through payroll because one of the requirements of an S Corp is that you have to pay yourself a salary through payroll. So you get a W-2, you have Social Security and Medicare withheld from your paycheck, and those are basically the equivalent of self-employment tax. But any profit left over after you pay yourself is not subject to that 15%. So if you have $100,000 left over after you pay yourself, that's potentially $15,000 that you can save this year and every year going forward. There's no magic number for when an S-Corp makes sense. You just wanna make sure that the tax savings that you realize more than offset the additional costs of operating an S-Corp, which would include the tax return, maybe a payroll tax service. But typically you wanna start thinking about it or at least considering it when you hit that $35,000, $40,000 of annual profit. Next tip is to track your activity not just for tax purposes, but also so you can build your business. Once you have a separate bank account and some type of bookkeeping system, make sure you actually stay on top of it. Track your numbers and pay attention to them. A message that I try to emphasize is that bookkeeping isn't just so that we have numbers for our tax return. That should be secondary. The main reason we do bookkeeping is that so we have insight into what's going on in our business. Because when you can see what's going on, you can make decisions that are gonna impact how your business grows. So remember, you're not doing your books just for tax purposes but also so you can assess your profitability and grow your business. Next tip, do I need receipts? Maybe, but maybe not. So the IRS wants to see two things. They want you to have a record and documentary evidence. So a record would be something like your bookkeeping program, your spreadsheet, or your logbook. Something that shows your business transactions. And the documentary evidence is something that substantiates your record. The most common form is typically a receipt, but it doesn't have to be. It could also be an invoice, a canceled check, a photo, a bank statement. Now, not all of those are as equally strong types of evidence, but typically, as long as you have something, you don't need to spend your time worrying about this. So what if you don't have receipts? My main advice for that is just to do better going forward and not really worry about the past. It's typically not worth your time to go back and try and gather up all the receipts for every single transaction because the likelihood that you ever have to reference that or produce it for the IRS is extremely, extremely low. So just do it when you think about it going forward, put them in a digital folder and forget about them. Next tip, should you hire somebody or do it yourself for taxes? This one really comes down to your comfort level and the level of complexity of your tax situation. The less complex your tax situation, the less likely you are to make any mistakes on your tax return. For example, if all you have is a W-2, that's gonna be pretty hard to mess up. And there are a lot of ways that you can file your taxes on your own for free pretty quickly. But if you have a side business, if you've had any major life changes, if you have any extra investments, you might want to at least consider hiring someone to take a look. But again, if you're comfortable with all that, programs like TurboTax do a pretty good job of helping you get through your tax return. But if you find yourself with an increasing amount of anxiety as it takes you through the tax interview, that might be a sign that it's time to outsource. The next tip is to learn about how directly taxes impact your life and your goals. Unfortunately, taxes are an inevitable part of life, and the more we can optimize our tax situation, the easier it's going to be to deal with them in your business and in life. In the surveys that I've done, taxes are the number one source of anxiety in small business. I've seen firsthand how learning just the basics of taxes can help drastically reduce that anxiety and frees up a bunch of energy for people to focus on other business activities that really matter or on areas of your personal life. Most of us have enough on our plate that the last thing we need to worry about is more taxes. And you'll likely find that once you take care of that, 
working toward and reaching your ultimate goals becomes that much easier. Next tip, what's the difference between self-employment tax, income tax, and sales tax? Self-employment tax is basically a 15.3% tax on your profit of your self-employed business activities. So if you have a side business or a business that you own, you are likely subject to self-employment tax. And this is a tax that comes as a shock to a lot of us when we first start our own business. And then on top of that, you have the regular income tax. So income tax is the one you're probably most likely familiar with. It's the one that's withheld from your W-2 at the federal level and sometimes the state level. And this is what we file our annual tax filing for with the IRS in the state to determine how much income tax you still owe. Sales tax is totally separate and it's not part of your annual federal tax return. This is something that's typically regulated by the state. And for most of us who sell on a platform like Amazon or eBay, Poshmark, Etsy, the platforms now collect sales tax for us and most of us don't have to worry about it. Next tip, what are quarterly estimated taxes? So if you have a W-2 job, you're used to your employer collecting your tax for you. You can see on your pay stub how they withhold your federal income tax and they're remitting that on your behalf on a regular basis. So when you're self-employed, you might have to remit that on your own because there's nobody taking care of it for you. The main rule is that if you're going to owe over $1,000 at the end of the year, the IRS wants you to break that up and pay it throughout the year. The exception to that is if you've already paid in or had withheld an amount equal to your prior year tax liability. In that case, you don't have to make any additional estimated tax pay Payments, but you still might owe tax at the end of the year. You just won't owe any penalties for not paying it beforehand. And you can watch one of my YouTube videos where I talk more about those rules, but there's no significant filing associated with the estimated tax. It's really just a payment. You can go to irs.gov payments, go on and verify your identity and just make the payment, keep a record of it. And then if you end up having paid too much, you'll get that back at the end of the year as part of your income tax refund. Next tip, sales tax. Most states have some type of sales tax and states also now have marketplace facilitator laws, which requires the marketplace facilitators, such as Amazon, eBay, Poshmark, Etsy, to collect the sales tax for us, the sellers. So there's not a lot we have to do anymore as far as sales tax goes. The exception to that is if you want a reseller certificate to give to a vendor so that they don't have to charge you sales tax, typically you have to register for sales tax, in which case the state expects you to file the sales tax return. But since you're not the one collecting it, you're basically just jumping through hoops and going through the motions and you're not paying any sales tax, but you are having to file those sales tax returns, but they should show up with zero tax due. Now where you might actually have to collect sales tax is if you are selling through a platform that is not a marketplace facilitator, such as Shopify. In that case, you should collect sales tax on the sales to customers who are in a location where you have nexus either physical nexus or economic nexus. So if it's in your state where you live, you have physical nexus. If you have a warehouse in a state where you make a sale to a customer, you have nexus and you should collect sales tax on that sale. Or if you have economic nexus, which means you have over a certain amount of sales in that state, then you should also collect sales tax there. Next tip, do you want a hobby or a business? If you have a hobby, you don't have to pay any tax, right? Wrong. Hobby income is actually taxable and most expenses are not deductible. So when would that ever make sense? Probably never. Business income is taxable, but most of the expenses are also deductible. So there's really not a compelling reason that I can think of why you wouldn't want to be a business and take advantage of all those deductions to reduce your taxable profit and reduce the tax that you have to pay. Next tip, be aware of the new 1099 rules and the new IRS structure. Prior to 2022, payment processors were required to issue 1099s if you had over $20,000 in 200 transactions, but that limit has been reduced to just $600. That means that if you received $600 from eBay, Amazon, or Poshmark, or almost any online platform, that they're required to send you a 1099 and also to send that information to the IRS. So millions of sellers who before were unnoticed by the government will now be on the government radar. And you'll need to make sure you include that income in any associated expenses on your taxes or you'll be getting a nasty gram from the IRS. And this isn't new. You should have always been reporting that income. It's just now the IRS is gonna know about it. And if you don't report it, they're gonna come after you. And the IRS just got almost 50 billion to ramp up their audits and tax collection efforts. So there's that. Next tip, how to deduct inventory. 
So you may have heard of the cash versus accrual methods of accounting. And typically when you hear about that, what's being referred to is the overall method of accounting for your business. And it just means when do you recognize the income and expenses? So under the cash method, you recognize income when you actually receive the cash, regardless of when you sent the invoice. Under the accrual method, you would recognize income when you send the invoice, even if you haven't collected the cash. But what we're talking about here is the cash or accrual method specifically with regard to inventory. Now the historically required method of deducting your inventory has been the accrual method. So you can have an overall cash method for your business, but for inventory, historically you've been required to only deduct your inventory when you sell it not when you purchase it. So I have another YouTube video where I go deep into the details about this, but now there's another method that it looks like you can use, which I refer to as the cash method for inventory, and that refers to deducting your inventory when you purchase it. So this is a method that you would use if you value simplicity over insight into your books, because I like the way that the accrual method for inventory shows your books, because it does a better job at matching up the deduction to the income that it belongs to. And again, check out my other YouTube YouTube video if you want to learn more about that. Next tip, find the best cost method to keep track of your cost of goods sold. Now this is if you're using the accrual method for inventory where you calculate your cost of goods sold by deducting only the inventory that has sold. So if you do that, you need a way to keep track of your inventory. And I have different free spreadsheets to help you do this. One of them is the individual tracking method where you keep track of every single item that you purchase, the purchase date, the purchase price, the item description, and then you also keep track of what date you sell it and how much you sell it for. And then at the end of any month or year or given period, you can determine the cost of everything that's sold. At some point, tracking items individually is gonna to become too tedious. And at that point, I recommend you switch to some type of average costing where you're not keeping track of individual items, but rather the total cost and the total quantities of those items to determine an average that you use to calculate your cost of goods sold. Next tip, be alert for scams. The IRS doesn't initiate contact with taxpayers by email, text message, or social media channels to request personal or financial information. So if anyone is requesting information from you through one of those channels, you can be pretty sure it's not from the IRS and that it's some type of scam. The IRS initiates almost all contact through regular mail delivered by the United States Postal Service. There are circumstances in which the IRS will call or come to your home or business, but they would have already contacted you by mail prior to that. Next tip, understand the difference between tax planning and tax preparation. So if someone comes to me at the end of the year with kind of a messy tax situation, they say, here you go, work your magic. There's not a magic wand that I can wave to just optimize their tax situation in an instant. Doing things throughout the year are what's gonna drive the tax savings. An analogy that I like to use is the dentist. So if you don't brush your teeth all year long and then you go to the dentist, he or she is gonna have a big mess on their hands and they can't just fix it or optimize your dental situation in an instant. But what they can do is recommend that you brush your teeth regularly, that you floss, that you use mouthwash or whatever. And doing those little things throughout the year are what's really gonna make the biggest difference in the future. And it's similar with your tax situation. What can you do throughout the year that's gonna help maximize Maximize your tax savings. Should you form an S-Corp? Do you need to do better bookkeeping? Should you contribute to an IRA? There are a lot of little things you can do that are gonna put you in the best position for going forward. Next tip, review your business situation with a CPA. As part of tax planning, it can be helpful to review your situation with a CPA or other financial or tax professional. Now, if all you have is a W-2 job and no business, no investments, no kids, nothing else that would add any complexity to your tax return, there's only so much you can do and it might be a short meeting. But the more moving pieces you have, the more you might benefit from collaborating with a tax professional to make sure you're doing things in the most optimal way. Next tip, deducting donations. Most businesses do not get a deduction for your donations. If your business gives a cash contribution to a charity, your business can't deduct that donation. But that donation does flow through to your personal tax return and can be eligible for a deduction there. And when it comes to deducting your inventory, you don't get a separate deduction for donating the inventory, but you can deduct the original cost of goods. So if you have inventory in your death pile that you decide to donate, you deduct what you originally paid for it. So it's just as if you sold it for zero dollars. That'll be the same as if you dispose of it or destroy it. So you deduct it as part of cost of goods sold. Next tip, how to account for consignment sales. 
So once your friends stop making fun of you for selling online and start seeing that you're actually making some money, they'll inevitably ask you to sell some of their stuff for them. And this is what's called consignment. And in this case, you would be the consignee and they would be the consignor. Since you're selling their goods, you don't own the inventory and you don't have any cost of goods sold associated with that sale. The easiest thing to do to account for the transaction is to record the income from the sale and then deduct their payout as commission. The difference is what you keep and becomes part of the net profit on your tax return. You'll see mixed information about whether you need to send them a 1099 for their payout, but from an accounting standpoint, they're actually the ones paying you a commission for selling their goods. You're the one doing them a service. So if anything, they should be the ones giving you a 1099. Next tip, how to account for the home office deduction. If you have a space that you use regularly and exclusively for your business, then you probably qualify for a home office deduction. And it doesn't have to be an entire room, it can just be a space, as long as you use it exclusively for the business. Now there are two different methods you can use. You can use either the simplified method or the regular or traditional method. And with the simplified method, you can deduct $5 per square foot up to 300 square feet. So it's a maximum of a $1,500 deduction. And with the regular or traditional method, what you do is you take the proportion of your office square footage to the overall home. So if it's 10%, 20%, or even 50%, then you can deduct that percentage of the shared expenses that are shared between your business and your home, such as your rent or mortgage interest, your property tax, your utilities, repairs, potentially depreciation on your home. And each year you can use the method that's more beneficial to your business. Next tip, how to deduct mileage. So when it comes to mileage or auto expenses, you can deduct either mileage or your actual expenses. So at the end of 2022, the deduction you get for mileage is 62 and a half cents per mile. And typically the IRS will adjust that rate every year. So you can either take the mileage deduction or a deduction for your actual expenses, which includes your gas, insurance, maintenance, repairs, and it's the business portion of those actual expenses. So if you start off using the mileage method, in a future year, you can always switch to the actual method. But once you use the actual method, you cannot switch back. So keep that in mind. And the easiest way to keep track of your mileage is to use an app like MileIQ. Next tip, don't forget to deduct your cell phone and internet usage. So these are deductions that people often forget about, but most of us use our phones and the internet for our businesses to a significant degree. So there's no exact way I know of to estimate the business portion, but I've never seen anybody get in trouble for estimating. So if you determine that you use your cell phone six out of every eight hours per day, that's 75% business usage. And you can deduct 75% of your cell phone bill and of the phone itself, and you can determine the deduction for your internet in the same way. Next tip, how to deduct your travel and partially deduct your vacations. So if you go to Las Vegas, let's say for a business convention, then the main purpose of your trip is for business and you can deduct the flight or the travel to get you to and from Las Vegas. But if you decide to stay an extra two days to see the sites, any lodging or travel that you incur on those days is not part of your business deductions. But let's say you go on vacation to Las Vegas for a week and two or three days out of that week, you go sourcing. So you're working, the travel that you incur on those two to three days where you're doing work in your business, you can deduct that lodging and that local travel. But since the primary purpose of your trip was not business related, you can't deduct the travel to and from Las Vegas. Next tip, be familiar with depreciation. So typically when you buy equipment or large assets, you're supposed to capitalize rather than deduct those items. And that just means you count them as assets on your books and you take the deductions for those items over time. So you might have to deduct it over five years. But then there's a thing called section 179 depreciation that allows you to take all the depreciation for that item in that first year. So you can basically deduct the whole entire thing, but it still shows up as an asset on your balance sheet. Luckily, most of us don't have to worry about either of those because there's something called the de minimis safe harbor rule, which allows us to just deduct any item that's less than $2,500 without having to capitalize it or keep it on our balance sheet. We can just expense it on the books and deduct it according to the de minimis safe harbor election. 
Next tip, avoid late penalties. There are penalties for lots of different things, but the main ones that I see are the penalties for failing to file your tax return on time and failing to pay on time. So you can file an extension to give you an extra six months to file your tax return, but it does not give you an extension to pay any tax due. And if you fail to pay on time, you're gonna incur a penalty of 0.5% of the tax owed per month up to 25%. But if you don't file on time, you're gonna incur a penalty of 5% of the tax owed per month up to 25%. So the failure to file your tax return is actually more severe than the penalty for not paying. So you wanna make sure you file your tax return on time. And if you do incur penalties, you need to be aware of something called the first time penalty abatement. And this basically means that if it's your first time messing up, you can call the IRS and you can simply request a waiver through the first time penalty abatement and they should waive the fee. Next tip, should you be worried about getting audited? Before the Inflation Reduction Act, I would have said don't worry. If your books are in order, I'd still say don't worry, but the chances of being audited just went up with the billions of dollars the IRS is receiving to build up their audit enforcement. But audits typically aren't what people think. Typically you'll get a letter saying that you've been selected for an audit and it's gonna request support or evidence for two or three areas of your tax return, maybe inventory and office supplies or maybe mileage or whatever. And they're gonna say, we're auditing these specific areas Areas, can you please send us detail or some type of supporting documentation that shows us how you get to this deduction that you're claiming on your tax return? And then you'll provide whatever support you have, ideally that ties out to that number, and then the audit will be done. And if you don't have that detail, you're going to have to recreate it to the best of your ability. And I've had clients do this successfully, and it's never that big of a deal. Next tip, establish a good bookkeeping routine. Optimizing your taxes starts with good bookkeeping, and good bookkeeping starts with having a good frequency. And typically that means getting in and doing your books at least once a month, if not more. You want to automate your bookkeeping as much as possible. You want to go in and categorize your transactions, make sure you're reviewing your financial statements, and then use those numbers to make decisions to drive your business forward. Next tip, educate yourself and take action. If there are things about taxes or bookkeeping that make you anxious, you have an opportunity to learn to get rid of that anxiety or to hire someone to handle it for you, or ideally a combination of the two. And even if you do hire someone, having a basic education is gonna go a long way in helping you to have the most productive conversations to really optimize your situation. A professional can only help you as much as you let them. And if you don't know where to go to get the information you need, it's not gonna be as effective. So keep educating yourself about the basics of accounting, bookkeeping, taxes. There's so much free information out there on social media, YouTube, blogs, TurboTax, or IRS articles. Just make sure it's coming from a reputable source and not your friend who heard from someone on TikTok that everyone should have an S-Corp. And if you don't know where to start, I highly recommend my Reseller Tax Academy course, which has helped thousands of people reduce the anxiety and replace it with confidence about their tax situation. Subscribe for more videos where I'll talk more about how to get your taxes and accounting on track in your reselling business and use the other links below for more resources to help you optimize your tax situation and overcome the anxiety so you can focus on building your business profitably.